Aftercare Explained. Why we tell you to do stuff. Coming up next on Body Piercing Basics, episode number 12. For those who are new to the channel, my name is Davo. I'm a professional body piercer and have been since 1994. I'm the owner and operator of the Axiom Body Piercing Studio here in Des Moines, Iowa. And we're located on Inside Skin Kitchen Tattoo. So what I'm talking to you right now, I'm talking to you at a level of expertise of having thousands and done thousands and thousands of piercings and helped thousands and thousands of people heal through the process. What we're going to talk about today is body piercing aftercare. Why we tell you to do certain things, what's the thinking behind it, and what's the methods behind it. Um, also, a few things as kind of a bonus fact of to avoid. A couple things we should probably touch on right off the bat. Aftercare is an evolving thing. Uh, I've been doing this long enough to remember when we suggested that you use harsh surgical scrubs and you rotated the jewelry through um, for six months to a year in the shower twice daily and also suggested using bacitracin zinc or some petroleum-based product for the first three days. It took a while for people, well not a while, it took, it, we've evolved since then. Um, the reason why you see so many conflicting viewpoints on the internet is a couple of different things. Because I'm sure if you've come across this video, you've been searching for answers and you've had about eight or nine different ones. And the reason is, is that some people tend to get locked into this is what works. Uh, in some ways that's a good thing because if it ain't broke, don't don't fix it. But in other ways, it is toxic. Um, the other problem with, and the reason why you're getting conflicting viewpoints is who trained them, who was the initial person, whether or not they belong to some magical organization that, that sends down things for the ministry to tell them to do, um, which they pay a price to be a member of and doesn't really say anything about the amount of research, expertise, knowledge, training that they've had, but the, put the sticker on the door and the gods have worn down great information that only they should know. I'm saying all this because I'm recording this in March of 2019. My aftercare instructions have changed 12, 13, 14 times over the last 25 years. Chances are they may change again as I learn new stuff, as I come across new information. My experience as a piercer has always been, I always take things from multiple sources and try to come up with a conclusion. So that includes research of what's going on in the piercing industry, that goes into research that's going on in the medical industry, um, in feedback from my clients and my own personal experience healing out piercings. Combine all of that and then you should come up with a pretty decent idea. The problem is, is that most people aren't willing to do that. They just take things that at, at they have experts that they decide they're going to follow and they will stick with them like they're a religion. So, um, that's something you should consider. If you've had conflicting viewpoints from your piercer than what I'm about to tell you, or even myself, talk to us about it. The idea behind these videos is to give you kind of an educated knowledge to a degree enough to go in and have a conversation with somebody about it. The other thing I want to bring up before we get into the meat and potatoes is that regardless of what you do, regardless of how well you take care of it, if you give a piercing enough time, it will heal, regardless, unless you have some type of medical uh, condition that is impeding your body's ability to heal the piercing. So, uh, will you heal that out without problems, scarring, infection? Probably not. Will it take an extremely long time for it to heal? Probably will. So, keep that in mind. I've had plenty of clients heal out using terrible aftercare instructions. I've had clients that have come in and said, oh, I took care of mine for two days and it healed fine. Uh, everybody's different. 
there's no right way. That's one of the reasons why there's so many conflict, conflicting viewpoints is we're dealing with the human body and everybody is a little bit different. What works for Jane may not work for John. What works for John may not work for Ethel. It's the reality of life on this planet. We're all a little bit different. One of the things I always tell people when they've been pierced at other places and had conflicting viewpoints uh, after care instructions is I always ask them, how was their experience healing out that way? Did they have issues this way or that way? And generally what I'll do is I'll suggest, hey, try this out. If you start to see negative effects, go back to the way you healed out your last piercing. Because your body's probably going to tell you what it wants and what it needs. And it's probably going to help with the healing process if you just pay attention occasionally. One other thing, aftercare products. Aftercare products have become part of the body piercing industry's upscale, upsell. You know what an upsell is? Upsell is where you go in and you're like, okay, I'm going to buy a new car. And I looked in the paper and the car is $2,500. And then you get there and they're like, yeah, it's $2,500, but you're really going to want to have that extra spare tire. And you probably want to do the undercoating to prevent the rust and this. And the next thing you know, it's $5,000. That's upselling. Or if you walk into a place because there's a sale uh, on a particular type of jewelry or um, like at a body piercing studio. And then they go, well, you know, that's our basic jewelry. It's not really our best stuff. You know, if you want the really good stuff, it's going to be this much. Another way they do this is by going, oh, hey, um, you can buy this stuff at a Walgreens or wherever, but, or you can even mix it up yourself. But, you know, it's, it's just so much easier to, to buy this $10 four ounce spray bottle instead of doing all that. That's part of the motivating factor. The other thing to consider with a lot of these products is they spend a lot of, a lot of time, a lot of resources, and a lot of money advertising and driving their product, specifically targeting those in the body piercing industry. So they'll suggest it. Just like the pharmaceutical companies of, you know, affect what doctors prescribe. In some cases, many of these aftercare products have been pushed the same way. So always take that into consideration when you are doing your aftercare selection, so to speak. Okay, let's get into the meat and potatoes. Body piercing aftercare kind of falls into, there's basically four parts. The first part is helping your body heal and aiding in that process. The second part is helping your immune system fight off foreign pathogens. The third part is eliminating possibilities of contamination where you've introduced a foreign pathogen into the area and caused an infection. We call it cross-contamination prevention. Uh, well, not just us, but the medical industry, scientific community, everybody calls it cross-contamination prevention. The fourth one is isolating the piercing. I'm going to go through each one of these and kind of give you a breakdown of my thinking and why I choose to do things or suggest doing things the way I do and why I've done it myself. Number one, aiding in your body's ability to heal. So here's some things we're going to do to help heed or help speed up that, that healing process. Faster the healing time, the less likely you see infection, the less likely you are to see problems. So it's very important that we try to make your body heal as fast as possible. I suggest hot soaks of warm water and sea salt. I do still suggest mixing it up yourself. Though a lot of people will try to sell you a saline solution. The problem I have with saline solution and a lot of the products on the market is that it's very expensive. Um, it often has a lot of additives that aren't clearly marked on the packaging. For example, uh, one particular product that claims the healing power of the ocean contains egg whites and other food preservatives um, that it touts as antiseptics, though they've never been proven clinically to be anesthetic. Uh, they can kill off foodborne pathogens. That's That's been proven. They can do that. They can keep your... They can keep your oatmeal from, from spoiling. They can keep your fruit from spoiling. But there's been no proof that they actually can kill off a large strand of other forms of bacteria. So, keep that in mind. 
The other problem I have with the saline solution stuff is it's very, very expensive. You go through it very quickly. Uh, the, the final thing I have with it is you can't warm it up unless you squirt it out in a thing and then warm it up and you're going to find out how little fluid ounces there really is in those things. The problem with it not being warm is it doesn't isn't as effective as heating it up and doing a hot soak because it, hot soaks draw waste debris from the pure saline. They also increase that circulation and flow of oxygen, which is really helpful in your body's production of skin cells. Um, soaks also um, salt actually contains minerals and nutrients that are helpful in your body's production of skin cells, and it really helps to soothe it, and it can help with inflammation a little bit. So all three of those things are helpful. And they kind of, the sprays especially, will kind of take some of the sting out of things, even right after the piercing's been done. What it has turned into is kind of a catch-all for everyone to run to when it comes to aftercare products. It's easy to sell. There's plenty of them on the market. Uh, most of the information has been provided by the companies themselves as a form of marketing. They've spent a lot of money Targeting the body piercing industry directly and especially those in the piercing industry professionals and saying, hey, this is the best thing since sliced bread. <sighs> Wide use has seemed okay. I've only seen a handful of people over the years have reactions. Like I said, the person who was allergic to egg whites. Um, is it? Are you getting your value with them? No, if you're going to go that direction, I would suggest just going and getting uh, a saline-based wound care. You're going to get exactly the same thing without all the additives and extra stuff in marketing. The thing it has turned into is an upscale method for the uh, body piercing professional that, you know, instead of charging, I don't know, $75 for a piercing with jewelry, they can now sell it for $85 because they're going to suggest you buy this little tiny spray can to use. The other thing, just one more note on using those products. They are designed to spray directly onto the piercing. They are not designed to be put on a Q-tip or a cotton swab and then rubbed around the area. Both of those things have little strands on them. They can wrap their way around the piercing, get snagged on it, um, and cause a, like a ring of cloth to be on the inside of the piercing, which can agitate the piercing holes. Um, it can also harbor bacteria and other problems. The other thing with saline is you always want to rinse under running water after you get done with it. The reason being is the salt crystals, if you leave them against the piercing, can dry the piercing out. Yep, can dry it out. Yep, it does that. It's salt. The other thing you can do is it hardens a crust on the jewelry, which once again creates a situation where it can be abusive to the piercing itself, um, can cause issues with uh, harboring bacteria and other pro uh, pathogens. So always rinse afterwards. The way I suggest doing it is an eighth of it is old school. Take a cup of, water, of distilled water, heat it up in the microwave, drop in an eighth of a teaspoon to a quarter teaspoon of sea salt, let it dissolve, should taste about as salty as your own tears. Submerge the piercing um, or do hot compresses where you take a clean paper towel, soak up the substance, lay it against it for roughly about 10 minutes, twice daily. The other thing you need to do to aid your body in healing faster is be healthy. That means eat a well-balanced diet, get plenty of sleep, and reduce the amount of stress in your life. Not sleeping, eating unhealthy, partaking in too many uh, intoxicating substances, uh, living the life of uh, an outlaw, <laughs> and not eating right. All those things are going to make, you, make your healing much longer than it needs to be. Um, Eat plenty of fruits, vegetables, meat if you're into meat, uh, get plenty of rest, and try to reduce the amount of stress in your life. Relax. Relax. Life's good. Now, let's move on to number two. This is aiding the immune system. This is the one that's kind of controversial with a lot of people, partly because they've all bought into this idea that you just use saline solution on it. We've kind of gone from one extreme at the beginning of overusing cleaning products to the other extreme of almost don't use anything. Here's my thoughts on it. 
There have been numerous studies that have came out over the years that reducing the amount of bacteria in the area is going to increase your body's ability to fight off infection. Plain and simple. If you keep the wound clean, less likely to see infection. Many people will say that the saline is enough, but as an added precaution, it does not hurt to clean the area, not the piercing itself, but the area around the piercing with an antimicrobial germicidal soap once, maybe twice a day. Uh, I generally suggest doing it at least once a day. You just apply the soap, lather it up really well, very small amount, apply it to the piercing area, like let's say an eyebrow, do kind of a little, you know, half dollar area around it. Let it stay in contact for 30 seconds and then rinse under running water. What that's doing is it's reducing the likelihood of foreign pathogens being in the area. When you reduce the amount of foreign pathogens in the area, your immune system does not have to work as hard and your body can, instead of applying all this energy to fight off foreign pathogens, can target itself towards growing tissue. The other thing to consider is that you're not used to having an open wound in your body, so you're probably at some point going to contaminate it and not even know it. Um, you might want to do it a second time if you contaminated the area just to be on the safe side. It's just an added precaution. It's a fail safe. The biggest things with soap, use very mild soap, lather it up well, use a small amount, and immediately rinse it under running water after that 30 seconds. Dry, it will dry out the tissue if you don't. The other thing is don't use harsh soaps, cleaning products, etc., wound cares. Here's, here's a breakdown of a list of things you don't want to use. Hibiclins, way too harsh. Ba uh, Provodine iodine, way too harsh. Um, Bactine, don't use that. Rubbing alcohol, uh, hydrogen peroxide, witch hazel, all those things are way too harsh and so they're going to prolong the healing period. They're going to dry out the piercing, not allow it to discharge properly and cause all kinds of issues. Benzothoracoid based solutions like ear care solution, especially ear care solution because there's an extremely large amount of benzothoracoid in there. Antibacterial liquid soaps, they're kind of that borderline of, of possible issue. Um, a lot of them switched from trichloroacetate to benzothoracoride, but there is an extremely small amount by comparison to what is in ear care solution. So you can get away with it in a pinch as long as there's no moisturizers, fragrances, or other additives. Tea tree oil. Don't use it unless you absolutely have to. Tea tree oil is way too harsh and causes all loads of issues. I don't understand why anybody would use it on a daily basis if there was no problem with the piercing. If there is a problem with your piercing and, your and you went to see your piercer and they've said, hey, use a couple drops of tea tree oil, make sure that you're diluting it completely uh, and only use it if you've been advised to use it. The same thing with any antibacterial creams um, and ointments. Don't ever use anything that's petroleum-based. The problem with petroleum-based products on piercings is because it's a deep wound. Sometimes the infection can develop way down into the piercing. Let's say this is your skin, this is your skin, my wrist is your skin. The infection, for one reason or another, will form here. Your body wants to push that infection out while replacing with healthy tissue. Now, if you uh, put something on the top and cover both sides of it with something that doesn't allow your body to discharge that properly, like um, petroleum, it's not going to discharge properly. It's going to fester, which is going to lead to the infection moving in another direction as an internally uh, spreading infection or an inward uh, infection where it'll spread in other tissue, possibly turn septic. The other thing that can happen is your body will kind of, I will, it will isolate it, developing a cyst or an abscess, and they're very slowly, painfully pushing it to the surface. In both of those cases, you will need medical treatment. So don't use anything petroleum-based. Don't use it. No. Uh-uh. Don't use it. That said, <laughs> let's move on to the next one. Number three, cross-contamination prevention. Let's think about what's in there. Contamination, cross, cross-contamination. So what you're doing is you're taking contaminants from 
one place and putting it into another place. This is why we're so diligent about telling you to do things like wash your hands before you handle the jewelry and don't over handling it. Handle it, not handling it. I don't know. I guess I'm asking how you're handling it. I don't mean that. Do not overhandle the jewelry. Do not play with it. Do not spin it. Do not rotate it. Do not give it hugs at night. Leave it alone. The only time you really have any contact with a piercing while healing is when you're cleaning it or when you're doing soaks. The rest of the time, leave it alone. Stay away from it. And we'll get into that too of isolation. That's the next one. Um, no oral contact or exchange of bodily fluids on, near, around the piercing. Yes, just because the piercing is over here does not mean it's necessarily okay to exchange bodily fluids over here because pathogens do tend to travel on the skin. So keep that in mind, no matter what you're doing. I don't want to know what you're up to, but don't do that. Keep your environment clean, clothing, bedding, towels, anything that may possibly come in contact with the piercing. Uh, keep pets away from it. They just bring all the contaminants into whatever thing and yeah especially don't let them sleep in your bed especially uh and that uh, doubly so if they're one of those pets that sleep if you have a facial piercing and they sleep on your pillow no keep them out of there do not submerge the piercing in bodies of water you can't control the quality of that's everything but your own clean and well-maintained bathtub and that means your bathtub after you cleaned it well and keep the maintenance up and do it on a regular basis Everybody thinks the pools are safe. They aren't. Pools cannot generally keep up with the amount of contaminants that are in that water. If you did know what was in that water, you probably know go, wouldn't go into it if you like to put it on it. Any natural waters are going to be much worse. I've had people say, hey, it's, you know, we're going to blah, 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 and it's supposed to have the most pristine, you know, water and, you know, ecosystem on the planet. That means it's full of of all kinds of little microorganisms that keep it healthy, that environment healthy, that you don't want in your piercing. Because it'll cause an infection. Unclean objects. Depending on the location of the piercing, this can mean a lot of things. If it's your navel, it can mean your belt buckle. If it's your uh, ear, it can mean the telephone, the pillow, uh, the earmuffs, the headphones, the helmet, anything that comes in contact with it. If you wear a mask for work, that's gonna cause problems if you don't clean it on a regular basis. Now let's get into isolating. What I mean by isolating is piercings do not like pressure, rubbing, moving, shifting, etc. during the healing process. All those things will possibly lead to infection or other problem this includes sleeping, especially. It's probably one of the number one causes of issues we see in piercings is because somebody decides that it's okay to sleep on it, even though they may have been told that it isn't okay for them to sleep on it. I don't care how comfortable it feels to lay down on that piercing at the beginning of the night. You don't really realize how much you move and shift in your sleep. So you're going to be constantly moving the jewelry in and out. If it's a post style, if it's a ring, you're going to be flipping it back and forth. If it's, uh, you know, in a part of the body where you're applying a lot of pressure with clothing, it's going to constantly rub against it and agitate it. All those things will prolong your healing period and cause other issues. Piercings need to be kind of put in a safe zone and left alone. Don't handle it. Don't let your partner handle it. Don't put anything against it. Don't wear anything that's tied against it. Leave it alone and give it time to produce the skin cells it needs. If you go in there and you're constantly moving it and shifting it, you're breaking loose skin growth. You're making your body work twice as hard and it's eventually gonna get angry with you and start building up scar tissue. This is where those bumps and et cetera generally come from. Usually bumps are caused or keloids as they're commonly called, which is a slang term now. Yes, there are a real thing called a keloid, but most of the things that are told, people are told are keloids aren't keloids, they're, they're just scar tissue or some other kind of bump, like an abscess or a cyst or something else. What are the most number one cause, well, the number one cause of, of, of this type of bump, the red ugly bump off to the side of the piercing is constant moving, shifting and adjusting of the jewelry. Your body gets to the point where it just gives up and says, 
this is way too abusive. I'm going to build up some tissue to kind of protect myself. The only way to ever get rid of them is to remove the cause of it. The other causes of bumps can be everything from improperly pierced, as in the angle or the placement is wrong, um, user error basically on the way, on the part of the piercer, um, or jewelry that's ill-fitting or the wrong type or too heavy. It's all about, we want to isolate that piercing, give it the least amount of abuse possible, whether that be how it's angled, the jewelry size, the type of jewelry, and all the contact, the one thing the piercer can't control, the amount of contact you allow that piercing to have. So that means if you have your ear pierced, you got to stay off the motorcycle for a while because you're not going to be able to wear that helmet anymore. Not until it's healed. Just plan these things out in advance. That said, I think that pretty much covers most of it or it's completely worn me out. I'm not quite sure which. If you feel like I didn't cover something or you're confused by something I've said or maybe you got conflicting ideas and you're not sure who to believe, feel free to leave a comment. I'm happy to discuss this further with you. Um, if you're somebody that totally disagrees with me, leave a comment. I'd be happy to look at any studies you have that are independent and not produced by people that actually sell products um, to detect uh, maybe I'm wrong about something. It wouldn't be the first time. And maybe you'll teach me something, which then I can teach it to other people. That's how the world works. Go ahead and leave a comment. If you like the video, please leave a thumbs up. Um, if you are interested in body piercing, tattoos, and general body art discussion, and would like to learn more, please subscribe. Uh, we post videos three to four times a week covering everything from body piercing to tattoos and our weekly update and our conversational Q&A in the kitchen question and answer thing. So, and to make sure you don't miss one, go ahead and hit that notification bell so that it bugs the living tar out of you. If you don't want to be bugged, don't hit the notification bell. Till next time, um, those that are in the Des Moines, Iowa area, I hope to see you for your piercing needs in the future. Everyone, good luck with your piercings. Take care of them, and we'll see you soon.